Good morning, back again. Smaller crowd, busy day today. So today we're here to talk about the bulk of the annual report, part two. I tag that losing our touch. There are some positive developments to report in this part two of our annual report to the legislature. We have some improvements in the fisheries management, and MNR has even discovered in Algonquin Park a surviving population of a species of fish thought to be extinct. Fire management in parks is the planning is better, and with some caveats, I acknowledge that there are somewhat better wind turbine rules to protect birds and bats, and the MTO's new transit supportive planning guidelines are an improvement. However, after listing those points, my ability to raise government accomplishments in the environmental field gets a bit limited. In this reporting period, we saw no new bold legislation to tackle the challenges of our time. The business of government went on on a more modest scale, but it could hardly be said to have gone well. The report is full of examples of stumbles and retreats in the implementation of programs and initiatives that were seemingly well conceived and used to work acceptably. In part one of this report from two weeks ago, I previously tabled, I documented the failures of various ministries to meet their statutory process obligations under the Environmental Bill of Rights. And here in part two, I report to the legislature on the strange changes to the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program, which seems to anticipate the farming of our wild birds and animals. I'm at a loss to explain the reasoning behind the bait and switch of uh, approach used by the Ministry of Natural Resources when they posted a proposal to give farmers relief from restrictions on haying that could threaten the eastern meadowlark, like they already had for the bobolink, and then issued a decision that gave residential developers the right to wipe those hay fields out entirely. Neither do I understand how the Ministry of Natural Resources can completely fail to implement something as critical as the Provincial Wildlife Population Monitoring Program. Or similarly, I question how the Ministry of Environment can confirm to people they are being adversely affected by industrial dust emissions and then allow the problem to persist for years. Yet again, the pro province has tinkered with the low water response plan, but we remain without the timely ability to respond to increasingly frequent droughts and which threaten our aquatic ecosystems, water supplies and food crops. The business of protecting our environment and natural resources used to be a much more routine per process that largely ran smoothly. I don't know why even seemingly simple policy and program delivery has so many associated problems. I've identified the lack of resource capacities at key ministry in the past as at least part of the problem, but the current foibles, fumbles, and retreats point to problems beyond capacity constraints. Perhaps we're just losing our touch. Do you have any questions? You, you mentioned uh, with the with the industrial dust emissions that were going on that the MOE has identified this as a substantial problem that has been going on for a number of years now, but has failed to move forward or something like that. Well, I just I, it's remarkable. We you know people exercise their EBR right to file an investigation, and so you know one was done, and it became evident. We we have all the documentation. MNR, uh, sorry, MOE reports clearly established that there is a, a, a pollution problem going back years, and yet the problem persists. And, and so it seems uh, incredible. I used to work in pollution abatement. I was a, a pollution abatement officer. And uh, I know that the, the big bag of tools and orders and things that they have to uh, take action on this, uh, this sort of thing, it looks like a very straightforward industrial pollution emission problem that could be solved. I mean, if the company's having trouble, there are tools like control orders that could be used. But in fact, the ministry took inadequate action to fix the problem over a course of years. I just don't understand how they could do that. So they're not hamstrung in any way to be able to move forward with this? No, I, I know they have the, the ability and the tools to, to achieve compliance. And whether whether the company, if, if the company is struggling and has an inability or problem, there are tools or orders that you specially design for that kind of thing. Where are Why aren't those orders put on to companies? Why do they just keep fumbling along in the, in the obvious evidence of, of violations of the Environmental Protection Act? I'm sorry, we were at the McGinty conference. I didn't have time to read all of this, but sorry, I was at the McGinty conference. I wasn't able to read all this. Right. But a little bit more about the the implications, the the drought issue, and what more the government could be doing. Right. 
Well, of course, we had a drought here in 2012, as we do periodically, and with climate change, we expect them more frequently. And, and we have a low water response plan, which is a drought response plan, and it has three levels in it. In the first level, you, uh, the conservation authorities largely are charged with responsibility. They identify the water levels are going down to a certain critical level, and, they, and they, they're charged with asking people who take water, people who pump water out of those streams, to voluntarily cut their usage by 10%. When it gets worse to a certain threshold, it goes to a level two. And the, again, the conservation authorities are to ask for voluntary compliance to a level 20% reduction. But then trying to get to level three, because level three is where you can take mandatory action to reduce water usage. And the bureaucratic burden associated with going to level three is so large, we've never ever had a level three in the province of Ontario, even though this map, this, the orange and ye the, ye the yellow here are level ones, the uh, orange are level two in September, just a few a week ago. And there's no, there's no reds on that, there's level threes because we never had one. And that's the problem. Now, but who loses out? Well, you see, the, the, the reason this tough thing to do in level three is to go to uh, a taker, whether it be a golf course or a small manufacturer or something, and say, you must cut back your water usage. But who loses when you don't call level threes and the stream dries up? Well, the fish and the frogs and the living systems. We, the, the system's supposed to save some water for the ecosystem. And downstream water uses, let's be, let's be frank. But, but in fact, by, by having a system where level three can never be called, uh, it is a, you're purporting to protect the water when you're, when you're not really doing it. Everyone, um, sort of anecdotally was saying it's the lowest water they've seen up in, say, cottage country this year. Are, are there implications then for fish and, and frogs for, for next year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, up in cottage country, the, uh, I was just there, in fact, on the weekend, and the, uh, th those are mostly reservoirs. They're drawn down to a large extent. There are some local implications, but the, the biggest risk in this kind of thing is in the streams in southern Ontario. We have had streams completely dry up in past years, and that will become more frequent unless we, we take action and implement level three from time to time. Even that may not be enough, but we think with the climate change increasing the evaporation and reducing the waterfall, the rainfall, uh, this is a, a problem we have to deal with. Is this at all linked with the uh, low water levels that we're seeing throughout the Great Lakes? Or, and if so, what kind of... Um what kind of measures other than this pulling, limiting the amount that you can take out of streams can be, can the Great Lakes, of course, are, they're linked because the cause, uh, largely, there are a couple of links, in the upper lakes there's a couple of causes. One, there's suspicion that they over dredge the St. Clair River, but, but there's nonetheless the, the, uh, the climate change is, has, is, has warmed the climate such that Lake Superior and Lake Huron don't freeze completely, or if they do for only a very short period of time for winters, uh, very recent winters, and that increases the eva winter evaporation. You can picture, in the old days they froze solid, no evaporation. Now it's open water, huge expanse of, of area. You get evaporation, you get more snowfall as a result from, in sort of Halliburton area, but you lose the water from the Great Lakes. And that's the, the main cause of the problem in the Great Lakes, which is clearly related. But it's not takings, it, unless you consider the fact that it dredged the St. Clair River and, and are taking its more, more money, more, more water that way is a problem. But, uh, so they're related, but not the same thing. The, wind, sorry, my, no, the wind turbine uh, sure. issue. With, obviously, I mean, you go to great lengths to explain that this is a very small portion of land that should be protected, but obviously a lot of people have issues with wind turbines up north. Yes. They're going to use your report. Uh, yeah. They'll have it in their hands to explain why they don't want it. Do you, I mean, how serious is the issue for, and, ha and, and just so how, how carefully can they cite them? Like, is there, are there just a few areas that need to be protected, or does it have to be sort of considered right across the province? Well, that's why I identified these uh, important bird areas, these IBA, which are, you know, are identified by a, a, an independent non-government worldwide body who uh, uses criteria. And so, and they, and they were, you know, described well before we had wind turbines. So uh, it really is sort of a pure way of looking at the landscape and saying what areas are important to birds. And even though the, the bird mortality is very low relative to other sources for, for wind turbines, why would we go into important bird areas? And, and if we're into, a, as you mentioned, a period of conflict over these things, um, you know, for instance, uh, a lot of there was a lot of controversy associated with, with Point Pelee at, at one point a few years ago and whether wind turbines would be there. Well, of course, they shouldn't be there because I, everybody, in, I think, in, uh, understands Ontario knows what an important area for birds that is. And if we had this policy in place then, it wouldn't have been considered. People wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a fight over Port, Point Pelee because they're, it's an important bird area. So in that vein, going forward, I'm recommending, say, just do it. Just say important bird, bird areas, uh, as independently identified, will not host wind turbines, and then there won't be those kind of conflicts. 
you call the Provincial Wildlife Population Monitoring Program an abject failure after 18 years. Can you explain why it is that, uh, that MNR has failed? I, I can't explain why. I can explain how. Uh, <laughs> the, but it, it is, is beyond explanation how they allowed this to happen, I think. Okay, the, clearly they have. They have they have not committed the resources. This was, you know, one time estimated some years ago, it to be a almost $7 million program necessary to do this, and uh, they never committed more than a few hundred thousand dollars to it. And, and they haven't got the data. I've asked for the data. The data's not there. I know there is no long-term monitoring of our wildlife populations in, in the forestry. This is really, really important because the whole credibility of the Crown Forest Sustainability Act depends on the fact that the province has did commit and was required by law to monitor the long-term viability of vertebrate wildlife populations. You know everything from moose and deer all the way down to chipmunks. But and and they can't tell us if the uh, if that popular those wildlife populations have been harmed on the provincial scale or not. That speaks obviously to an important ecological thing, but it also speaks. To the to an economic risk for the province of Ontario, the forestry companies they're charged with you know protecting wildlife in the area of their operations and their forest management units, but they count on the province to do that province-wide population monitoring, and we export wood. <clears throat> our our market share depends on the fact often that we are ma managing our forests sustainably under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act, and can we stand up to a challenge? An international challenge on sustainability if we can't prove that we're n not harming wildlife, even when it's required by law that we do so. The natural question might be, uh, some people in the province might see a benefit in knowing how many moose that we might have, but, but squirrels and, and, and chipmunks and whatnot, as, as wildlife people might not think of them that way traditionally. Uh, so what's the, the link, and maybe you've already flushed this, sure. the, the link between knowing how many, like, how, what, what, how many wildlife animals we have in the province and the Crown Forest Sustainability Act? It's not a body count. It's, it's the functioning of the ecosystem. How do, you, how do you know the forest ecosystem is healthy and managed and, and still functioning properly on a, on a large scale? And the way you do that is you monitor the response by the activity of the, of the creatures, in this case the birds and vertebrate animals, larger animals, and you see how those populations are monitoring, if they're healthy, if they continue to be viable. And that gives you a, a whole measure that you, you haven't damaged the forest ecosystem. It will continue to be sustainable forestry and produce a healthy forest for future generations, the very essence of that. So it's a, ray of, it's a metric to, to monitor and prove you're doing it right and that you're not mining your forest for, for fiber and then leaving a, 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 you know, a resource for future generations that has been impoverished and, and, and damaged ecologically. So it is if you like, the key barometer to, sh to prove to the world that we can do sustainable forestry, which I think can, but part of that requirement is to do the homework and do the monitoring and to be able to prove it. And MNR is required legally to be able yes, to... Yes, and that's the other thing, of course, which is the other culprit is the Ministry of Environment, because the requirement to do this population monitoring is a requirement we technically call the Declaration Order under the Environmental Assessment Act, but it's an Environmental Assessment Act requirement in law. And the Ministry of Environment is charged with enforcing that law. And so, and I, you know, cite them specifically. Why, why did you allow this to happen, Ministry of Environment? You are the oversight body. You're the ones that are supposed to administer that, the Environmental Assessment Act. Are, are, is when, when one ministry is in charge of regulating and enforcing another ministry, is that, that kind of self-regulation ever sufficient? Well, it should be. I mean, it, in the sense that, I mean, we're all, they're all public servants and they're all working to the same good. Uh, we, but, you know, that kind of oversight occurs in a number of areas. There's requirements, cross-ministry requirements in enforcement in a large number of areas, uh, you know, certainly environmentally. The Ministry of Environment, you know, oversees aspects of other environmental assessment process in a whole bunch of ministries. And just one, one quick question about this as well. If in the event that Ontario was challenged under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act and we well, failed to challenge challenged under some uh, kind of trade thing, but uh, yeah, okay. for not, yes. order, not being able to establish they're sustainable. If so, we failed to, to have that kind of data, which we're legally required to have, what might some of the, the repercussions be? Well, uh, remember the, the fuss over the uh, softwood lumber crisis when the Americans decided to take us on? That would be uh, possibly grounds to challenge us then, but I think more, more, more immediately, we have uh, sort of the companies have gone to great expense to achieve levels of certification, whether it be a, a, a certification of sustainability of their own operations. There are a couple of different certification systems. And uh, they have to maintain that at great expense. Part of that certification system that they use for marketing their wood is, assumes or requires that the province will 
look at the big provincial population levels. They, the co company managing one forest up around Timmins can't be expected to account for the success of uh, vertebrate populations across northern Ontario. Only the Crown can monitor on that large scale and establish that we have sustainable forest management. But if uh, it, the companies have to look at their own territory, so if the, the certification of that wood is at risk if we're ever challenged, that, or if it's ever questioned that we're, we're have truly having sustainable forest practices. We done? Okay.